what's going on with women's sports. And, and I'm sorry, but like, it's not fair. It's not fair to girls. We are not built with the same muscle capacity, okay? And guess what else? You guys can't have babies. So there you go. That's how it works. XX, XY. And depending on what you're born with, you're going to have a certain hormonal capability and capacity, which is going to make you, if you were born as a man, stronger. I can't believe I have to explain this, but somebody needs to explain it to Joe Biden and that brilliant rocket scientist that he has for a PR person, Karine Jean-Pierre, who was asked this question in today's press conference. Watch. Tell me what you think of this one. Education. Daughters, does he care that girls are allowed to compete in sports without I just, fear I, of injury? I just, does he think it's fair for girls to have to compete against biological males? I just answered the question. It is a complicated issue. It is truly a complicated issue with a wide range of views, a wide range of views. There is no yes or no answer to this. It is complicated. There's a rule that the Department of Education has put forward, uh, and we're going to let that that process move forward. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, again, uh, we want to make sure that uh, while we establish guardrails with this rule, uh, that we also prevent discrimination as well against transgender kids. But again, a complicated issue with a wide range of views, and we respect that. <laughs> How is it that complicated? I mean, if, if somebody who identifies as female today, go for, you know, you want to identify as female, be my guest. Okay, like you, you do you, but don't compete against me in the swimming race or in the biking race or in the running race or anything else for that matter. For goodness sakes. I mean, this is where they, meaning these insane progressives who have taken this so far that it's like kind of a fascist. I mean, they are just they're off the reservation. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Okay. Well, you know what I'm saying. They're, they've gone too far. They've gone way, way too far. And let me just say that in the most politically correct terminology possible. Karine Jean-Pierre, to, to be insisting that she's got to protect the rights of, of people who were born as men but want to compete against women. I'm sorry. When it comes to sports, it's not that complicated. It's actually pretty simple. Pretty darn simple, except that it has become a kind of war. And the bullying that's happening is pretty intense. And Dylan Mulvaney is leading the charge. General Mulvaney out there collecting some award because somehow Dylan is like the content creator of the year. And while collecting the award, referred in very specific terms to the trans community and the trans community's allies. I brought this up yesterday and I'm like, what the heck is he using the word? Forgive me. She, whatever. Dylan, we're going to go with Dylan so that I can be so politically correct and not get myself in trouble or kicked off this. By the way, subscribe if you haven't, just in case, do me that favor. So here is Dylan Mulvaney talking about allies. And I just, I ask why Dylan would use that term. Oh my God. Hi. You know, I'm really shocked because I thought the only award I would ever maybe win was maybe a Tony Award, but now I'm a musical theater gal with a streamy. <laughs> theater TikTok, we made it to the mainstream. Uh, 532 days ago, I made a coming out video that turned into my Days of Girlhood series. And, uh, my life has been changed for the better, um, but on the flip side, there's also been an extreme amount of transphobia and hate. And I know that my community is feeling it, and I now know that even our allies are feeling it. And I look around this room, and I just see so many amazing allies that have platforms, and I think allyship right now needs to look differently, and you need to support trans people publicly, and, and, and I and proudly, and I think the trans community and the creator community actually have something in common, and it's that people often underestimate us. But I know that we can stay optimistic about just the future of transness in general, because if we can influence people to buy $22 Air One smoothies, we can also do this. Um, I just, I love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to go have a beer, and I love you. 
Yeah, like, why not just uh, throw in a little dig to Bud Light, <laughs> whose share price you sent plunging to the point where Anheuser-Busch, AB InBev, has now lost $40 billion worth of market cap. Sales in the last week are down 30%. Anyway, you heard the language, right? Very, very interesting choice. Using the word allies and allyship. And I said this to you guys, like, maybe it's just because I was a history major, but when I hear allies, I'm thinking... World War II. So it's like you're either with us as an ally or what? You're, you're a, a Nazi if you're not. And, and like we got to get our allies like more powerful and our ally ship. Like it's like a warship together. I mean, that was not lost on me. And again, I may, I may just be too sensitive to it because, again, I spent my uh, academic career studying history. But I thought that was a strange choice of words. Um, I, I want to play you something else because you look around at what's going on and it's really sad what's happening to some kids. I mean, some kids just, you know, they don't know how to fit in. They're going through an awkward stage and they're turning to this transgenderism, which has really significant long-term consequences. And if you make the wrong decision on that, like there's really no turning back, Right. That's why it's really hard when a 12-year-old is making these decisions. Anyway, somebody who is so far left, she may soon be right, is an academic named Camille Paglia, who did a, a big dissertation on this at, at Yale, like back in the 70s. And she's been so outspoken on feminism and gender issues throughout her career. And I want you to hear what she's saying on this, because her point is, is that we have seen things like this in history before, including in the Weimar Republic ahead of World War II, and it typically does not end well. So don't take it from me. Listen to a woman who has devoted her academic career to the study of these issues, Professor Camille Paglia. Here she is, and she said this back in, oh, I don't know, 2015? So this is from a while back, and yet it holds so true today. Proof of that. But now I began my, all my studies, my, my book Sexual Personae began as a dissertation at Yale, uh, graduate school, on androgyny. I've always been fascinated, attracted to, you know, to the subject of androgyny, uh, and, and that's what the Sexual Personae is. I explored it in history. But the, the more I explored it, I realized that, um, that historically, this, uh, this, uh, the movement toward androgyny occurs in late phases of culture, okay? as, a, as if a civilization is starting to uh, unravel. Okay, and that, that you can find it again and again and again through history in the in, in the in the Greek art. Okay, you can you can see it happening. All of a sudden, okay, there's a, there's a kind of uh, you know the, the the sculptures of of um, of uh, handsome nude young men athletes that used to be very robust. Okay, in the archaic period, suddenly begin to seem like wet noodles. Okay, you know, toward the end. Okay, and, the, uh, and that and that the people who 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 live in such periods, a late phase of culture. Whether it's it's the Hellenistic era, whether it's the Roman Empire, whether it's it's uh, the Mauve decade of Oscar Wilde in the 1890s, whether it's Weimar Germany, people who live at such times, okay, feel that um, they're very sophisticated, they're very cosmopolitan, okay, and homosexuality, heterosexuality, so what, anything goes, and so on, all right, and so, and but, but we, from the perspective of, of historical distance, okay, you can see that it's a culture that no longer believes in itself, okay, and then, and, and then what you, what you in, invariably get are, are, you know, are, are, are people who are convinced of the power of heroic masculinity, okay, on the edges, whether they're the Vandals and the Huns, okay, or whether, or whether they're the barbarians of ISIS, Okay, you see them, you know. Yeah, she's right. So in other words, this has happened before. I mean, maybe we didn't have quite the science to go along with it. Back in the 1890s and in the Weimar Republic, there was some of this going on. Actually, in Switzerland, they had a clinic for this. It's very, very dangerous stuff if you would change your gender. But her point is, is that this is what happens in late stages of culture when people no longer believe in their culture. They no longer believe in themselves. They look out the window. They can't tell if it's night or day. They don't know if they are male or female. And it permeates an entire culture. And then at some point, some people are like, okay, this is getting a little too weird. And they come in and they're like, no, this is this and this is that. And, 
And then you get into this very black and white environment, and usually there's violence ahead of it. So we don't want that, okay? Like, we don't want any of that, which is why it is so critical and so important that those progressives on the left try and spend two minutes understanding the damage that they are doing to our society, to our kids, and to our future. Like, you you do you, I do me, and we're all good, right? We can have respect for one another without pushing something down everyone's throat. Hey everyone, Trish Regan here. If you enjoyed that clip, please do me the favor of subscribing to the channel. Just hit that little subscribe button right over there. Did I do that right? Uh, Not quite, but you know where it is. Subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so that you get the alerts, and I'll see you back on the show.